here remembers this event? October 14, 2012. We're going to play for just a sec because it's so amazing. So on October 14, 2012, a lot of you here saw it. Felix Baumgartner, Red Bull, YouTube. They changed the world in more ways than one, and I want to get into that. Just give this another second just because it's amazing to watch. But this is the edited video. Coming home now. That's what Felix Baumgartner said. I'm Caleb Silver. I'm the director of business news for CNN, and I thank you for uh, coming to my talk here. I uh, am the director of business news. I cover. I run business news for television for CNN US and for online video, and I'm interested in streaming media. I'm interested mostly in audience behavior. What consumers like. What they watch. Where they watch it. How they watch it. I, I've given uh, talks at streaming media in the past talking about what we do in online video at CNN and CNN Money, but I've been really focusing a lot in the past couple of years uh, on consumer behavior. We know the industry is changing. That's why you're here today. That's why a lot of these companies are here presenting their technology. Uh, you're all consumers. I'm a consumer. I'm interested in where we are now and where we're going. As Wayne Gretzky used to say, I try to skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it is. And, we all know he had a little bit of success. So I'm always interested in where is the audience? Where is it headed? And hopefully we can shed a little bit of light on that today. As I said and I showed Felix, Red Bull, YouTube, they changed the world. It was a depth-defying stun, 128,000 feet from the edges of the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere, reaching a top speed of 833 miles an hour, falling for free fall for more than four minutes and 22 seconds. The entire jump lasted nine minutes. And the result? Eight million live page views, live video streams on YouTube. And a lot of you raised your hand that you'd seen it. I saw it. We couldn't take our eyes away. That was an amazing, an amazing event. And it didn't have to fit into the rigid programming schedules of linear television. It would never have worked, right? This was a depth-defying stunt. Everything had to come into place. The right weather, the right launch, the right technology. It had to happen on its time a perfectly suited event for the online world and the online audience. And as you can see, about 8 million people the size of the population of New York saw that, and it's pretty cool. And for all that, that event, for all of its danger, all of its hype, all the fascination of a man falling from almost outer space, it was dwarfed by what happened at 9 p.m. on February 1st, 2011. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? NCIS, of course. NCIS had 22.9 million viewers February 1st, 2011. Since 2009, NCIS is the most watched show on television in aggregate. Who here in this room watches it? You watch it. A lot of people watch that show. That is perennially in the top 10 uh, primetime audience numbers any night of the week, NCIS and NCIS Los Angeles. And I have never seen it, but a lot of people are really into it. It's a good television show. It's got the, that perfect sauce, that sweet sauce for what makes narrative television so good, the dramatic arc, arc, crime and punishment. We saw it with Law and Order. We see it with CSI. It is an amazing TV juggernaut, and it's still, it's still drawing amazing audience numbers. Um, I'm fascinated by this because, one, I never watch it. I don't watch a lot of primetime television, maybe except for sports and stuff like that, but so many people are watching it. And it leads me to the question on whether consumers are watching considerably less TV than they did four years ago. Now, who here thinks they're watching considerably less TV now than they did four years ago? All right, a few of you think that, right? Um, we, I was just listening to Adam Besserman's talk from Yahoo. The online audience is growing. 
online scripted programming is growing. Uh, the time we watch, watching, the time we spend watching online video is growing. Ad dollars are growing. Everything's moving towards it. But for all of that, TV is still the screen of choice. We're averaging four hours and 19 minutes a day per person watching television. Maybe not the folks in this room. I did a little networking last night at the Intel gathering. Most folks told me they're cord cutters. Um, but still, across this country, people are watching four, more than four hours of television a night. I don't know when they have the time, but they do. Are we watching more on DVR playback? Absolutely. A few minutes more than we were four years ago. Are we watching, uh, are we playing more video games? Yeah, video games are better, but only about three or four more minutes. And what about DVD playback? Who here has played a DVD in the last six months? Four, five, six of you? Um, still, television has been the screen of choice for us. And yes, we love our devices, and we're getting to love our devices even more. And when we do use our devices, TV is still predominant, but those streaming devices, desktops, Blu-ray players, gaming consoles, smartphones and tablets, they're, they're growing. Certainly they're growing, but still, Look at the lion's share of that pie. Right? Well, more than 50% of the people are still watching television on their TVs and their HD TVs. It still rules the roost. Hours per person per week boiled down in the target demo, 25 to 54, 80% of them are watching live television. They're watching NCIS. They're watching uh, The Daily Show. They're watching Mad Men. They're watching narrative television 80% of the time. Are they time shifting? Absolutely, we know that's happening. But still, the, the warm blue glow of television is still ruling the roost in our households. And some of you folks may not be television watchers, but most of the country still is, and they're watching a healthy amount of it. Now, live streaming is coming. It's a big deal. We know that. I want to talk about some of the, the uh, events that were the biggest live streams ever, Super Bowl, the Super Bowl last year between the 49ers and the Ravens, 10 million live streams. The TV audience was a little bit bigger. This is a little cut off, but the, uh, the Olympics, 45 million live streams over the, uh, over the course of two weeks. And Felix, 8 million, as I said before. But meanwhile, on television, look at those numbers. 108 million viewers for Super Bowl, last year's Super Bowl. It was still only the third most watched Super Bowl of all time. But we're talking about 108 million people. A third of the country is watching that. The Olympics, 219 million over the course of two weeks. So look at that scale, really. We're watching, we're seeing so many eyeballs go to the traditional blue box in our living room watching linear television. And sports is a real reason, you know, is a big reason they do that. It's a planned event. It's a big hyped event. Uh, the Super Bowl, obviously, is very popular. But other events, too, the Grammys and the Academy Awards. Now, are we also watching and streaming at the same time? Well, absolutely. Look what happened at the, uh, in the 2012 election. Um, sorry, this is getting a little bit cut off, but 65% of the, of the audience watched it on television. 27% were streaming it at the same time. And 6% were, doing, were, were only online. So we're still seeing that lion's share of uh, viewers for programmed events committed to television. And it makes sense. But we know the industry is moving. Now, I want to ask you, time shifting on our DVRs or our TiVos, if anybody still has a TiVo, is it cannibalizing the live television audience? Who here thinks that's happening? You're right. It's not. It's, it's amplifying how much more we watch. So time shifting continues to grow. You can see it in that yellow line. Um, but the total hours per minute of viewing is still super healthy, right? We're still seeing 31.4 hours per week uh, in television, but the overall consumption of media is growing with time shifting and streaming, and that's a good sign for people in my business. So we're not seeing this cannibalization that a lot of people had feared when they thought we would record our shows and, and catch up to them later. Now, a lot of us do that, and there are ratings for time shifted programming, but what the net effect of all of this is more media, more choices, more opportunities to watch it, and we're seeing that overall consumption grow. So not only have we, have we changed a little bit in the way we consume media, but we've changed how we consume media. We have that multi-screen experience. Anybody here with teenage kids in the crowd? Right? Or even yourselves. Look at the way you watch television. We have 
you know, we're very busy. We have our smartphones in front of us. We have our tablets in front of us. Maybe we have our laptop, or maybe we're watching in our home office, and we're TV's on here, and we're working here, or maybe we're doing something simultaneously. But we are very busy people with busy bodies and busy fingers. The concurrent use of other media while watching TV is a really interesting statistic when you look at it. 62% of us while watching TV, if we're using another device, are using our laptops. Maybe we have it on our laps. Maybe we have it on our desktops. 41% of us are using our phones, uh, our smartphones. 28% of us may be reading a book while we're watching television. 11% are on tablets. That number is going to grow as tablet consumption grows. And 9% of us are, are on our gaming consoles while that's happening. But as I mentioned with millennials, now these are you know, slightly older than teenagers, but they are super into uh, multitasking while they're watching TV. 50% of the 18 to 24-year-olds use their smartphones while watching TV. 44% of them are actually engaging in social media while watching TV at the same time. It's not a big mystery. We see it happening. We do it ourselves. And when we look at some of the programming we do that with, a lot of the time we're just using social media and maybe text, uh, update, tweeting or, or updating our Facebook or we're checking out Facebook and we're doing idle things while television is on. But there's this growing trend of social media and television um, working together uh, so that we're actually seeing tweets about shows as we watch, right? I'm sorry, the, the print's so small in this, I'll walk you through it, but what are we tweeting about when we watch? Nielsen just recently started doing ratings or, uh, uh, for TV viewing, talking about unique audiences, what they tweet about when they watch. And I'm just going to walk you through some of this. The Walking Dead, this was uh, last week, right? The Walking Dead had a big, was it a finale or a premiere? Um, is a leader in terms of people who are tweeting and watching TV at the same time. The Voice, American Horror Story, Scandal. Who here watches Scandal? Any Scandal watchers? Who tweets while watching Scandal? I urge you to look at, at the tweets uh, for Scandal and the audience that's following it while they watch. It is a huge audience of folks that are watching Scandal and tweeting about it at the same time. And it's become pretty addictive, according to a lot of my friends that watch it. So. The social media and, and the tweeting audience and the, the folks that are tweeting are actually helping, in some cases, build the television audience. And we're seeing that start to come on for the first time. Dedicated tweeting about particular shows, and some shows encourage it more than others, um, but we're starting to see that take hold. But at the same time, map that against what we're actually watching on television. What are we actually watching on television? I took this from the week of November 4th. Sunday Night Football, 21 million viewers. NCIS, 19 million viewers. The Big Bang Theory, who here watches that? 16.8, 16.9 million viewers. Country Music Awards, 60 minutes, always in the top 10. NCIS Los Angeles, a miracle. Those two franchises, always in the top 10. The pre-kickoff, Dancing with the Stars, Persons of Interest, it's, we are not at that level yet where that, that social media audience is really influencing what we watch on a grand scale, though we see it starting to creep in. And that's become pretty fascinating for programmers who are trying to engage their audience in as many screens as possible. Um, it's fascinating to me. True or false? Couch potatoes are an endangered species. False, false. False, false, right? We still love our couch. We're not endangered, we're enhanced. So this is a slide that shows what we do and where we consume our media. Now, we all hopefully have jobs and we're working, so. When we're working, we're not necessarily watching television, though for folks like me, it's my job to watch television. But we're consuming the majority of our media in home. That goes for television, obviously, 90% of it. 82% of the time we spend on computers is in home. 82% uh, of the tablet time is in home, and 64% is on our smartphones. Now, the rest of the categories don't even hold a candle, and it makes some sense, though, Obviously, our smartphones and our tablets are making it easier for us to watch in other places, but we are still homebodies. And when we're home, we're consuming media, as I said, over four hours of television a day. And we're seeing that online pick up as well, but predominantly this is still uh, a television-driven medium when we are on our couches. And when we're consuming media, whether it's television, but particularly online, what is it that we're interested in? Especially online, we have our, we have our specific categories of interest, right? I don't know if you folks can see this that well. I'll take you through it. 37% of it, news and current events. Good for folks like me in the news business. 
24%, cooking. Now who here is in their kitchen, they're thinking up a new recipe for Thanksgiving, or they're cooking for a family dinner, or just messing around, goes to the internet to look up a recipe right away. Right? I'd do it. Right? Oh, how do I make the best apple pie? You'll, you'll do a quick search and you'll find a lot of answers. Cooking is a huge category for us. Uh, sports and entertainment, another big category for us. Financial news and information, that purple line, pretty, pretty big category for us. Wellness is another big category for us, but that news and information is what folks are pulling in when they are searching for content online or they're streaming content. Now, I'm, I'm, now I'm taking out uh, companies like Netflix in terms of entertainment, which is its own animal, but when we just look at general news and information, that's still the dominant category. And this is an interesting uh, opportunity and paradigm for cable networks that are online. CNN obviously has a huge web presence, so do our competitors. But which cable networks are winning online? Which categories and which cable networks are winning? The Weather Channel. Make sense? Now, a lot of us use our apps to get the weather. We want to check it out in the morning before we head out. But the Weather Channel has become a huge online cable network property. Now, it ebbs and flows with what's going on in the weather, obviously, but it's still double the size in some cases of CNN, which is the biggest news property out there. Fox News, third, Comedy Central. You can thank Jon Stewart and Colbert for that. People looking for reruns. Who watches daily show reruns or repeats of segments the next day? Right, I do that. Um, we share that stuff virally. MTV, uh, obviously a very big cable network. The Cartoon Network, ESPN, NBC Sports, Nick, CNBC. So these folks have taken their cable network properties online and had, have had a lot of success, and it makes a lot of sense. Now, in terms of the cable networks that are winning online and winning with video, especially streaming video, whether it's live video or video on demand, which is still the predominant uh, method for folks, how is that translating into video ad revenue and video ad streams? ESPN, the dominant uh, media property in that category. The Weather Channel, there it is again. MTV, Comedy Central, Nick Jr. These folks have the most um, video ads that they're streaming in and around their content. 234 million, 370 in the second quarter for ESPN. That's a phenomenal amount of online advertising, and that just, the, the amount of online video content has nearly doubled that. That's an amazing category and a great opportunity for advertisers and folks that are looking to get into that business. So where is all this headed? Where, how do we capture these audiences without having to make them go to their desktop or their smartphone or their tablets? TV Everywhere, who's heard of TV Everywhere in this, in this room? Right, that's coming on, so TV Everywhere, is a big initiative by big media companies and programmers and cable companies uh, alike. This is allowing current pay TV video subscribers to authenticate and consume a significant amount of the content they purchase as part of their overall normal pay TV subscription on other devices. So you could be uh, in the kitchen, your kids are watching TV or your significant other is watching their program and you want to watch TV in your uh, as you're cooking in the kitchen or doing something else, or you set the tablet up on the, uh, on the treadmill, you could actually authenticate, sign in, and watch live programming. Now, a lot of folks who have cable subscriptions don't even know this exists yet, which is a problem for the industry. But there's a lot of cable companies, uh, MSOs, and cable providers that are actually leading in this category. Here's some of them. Of all these, NBC Universal streams the most content on other devices, live streams the most. It's got the most media properties, so that stands to reason, but it also has a lot of content that is perfectly suited for live streaming. Time Warner, this is a huge initiative in our company as we try to get in front of where the audience is and where they're going and what they're doing. We want to make it ubiquitous for everybody. Um, but of all of these, the NFL network is the only network that's, that programs live TV and streams the exact same amount, which makes some sense if you think about it. You're, you, you know, a lot of folks, if they can help it, try not to DVR their games because they want to see what's going on. They want to be in the conversation. Maybe they're updating their fantasy roster. But the NFL Network is a big leader in live streaming content. But Showtime, 
among just the, the pure content providers, is one of the leaders in this category. And they can probably thank uh, Homeland and some of their other successful programs for that, right? A lot of folks want to see that, but they may not be able to get in front of the TV or somebody else is watching TV at 9 o'clock on Sunday because there's a lot of competitive programming happening at that time. And there's a ton of opportunity here in TV everywhere, right? Most folks here who have cable uh, and some of these cable services have it at no additional cost. You've got a full range of functions. You can have your DVR. You can do video on demand. You can access your prime channels. Anybody here watch HBO Go? Anybody have that? Right? Um, it's available on a range of devices. I can watch it on, the phone, on my iPhone or uh, the Droid. I can watch it on a tablet. Um, and there's a seamless integration with advertisers just like television. So it's just like linear TV. It's just coming through my, my device. Now, some cable providers also insert their own, uh, their own endemic advertising into it. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for advertisers and there's a lot of growth for advertisers. But there's also a lot of challenges. I asked folks here who, who has it, who has TV everywhere, who even knows about it. A lot of you folks don't even know about it. I was just doing a, an informal canvassing of some of the folks last night at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the Intel gathering, and a lot of folks weren't even aware of it. They weren't even aware that they could do it, and a lot of folks w might have been aware of it, but were unwilling to authenticate. They didn't want to sign in yet again. That feeling of, I have to enter my name and password again? Am I about to get charged for something I don't know about? Uh, am I giving my information away? Are they somehow taking this information and doing something with it that I'm not aware of? I think that's a... Uh, that, you know, that, that might stop some people from even participating, even though they might know about it. Is it simple enough for folks? A lot of folks say it's not. We did an, in, we did an informal focus group on this, and folks are frankly afraid of the new technology, but it's out there, and it's, it's, uh, it's just as easy as turning on the television once you authenticate in. And then there's competition from the, uh, the over-the-top uh, device makers, and I walked around the exhi uh, exhibit hall and you are out there in full force and some of the leaders in that category, as you know, Arrow and Roku and Philmon and others, this is a big battle coming up and uh, it's heading into the court, uh, into courts pretty soon here and this will make a very interesting dynamic. I'm not an expert on any of these devices or how the technology works, but I know this is a room full of experts and a conference full of experts, but these are the different ways that we are trying to bring streaming media to, uh, to our audiences across the industry. I'm going to take your questions in a sec, but a few takeaways. Don't bury television yet. We're still watching an enormous amount of television, live television, across the country. New devices and streaming options are enhancing or extending our viewing. We know that. They are not cannibalizing it. We're not watching much less television, only four minutes less over the last four years. We're multitasking more than ever. You don't need me to tell you that. You, you do it yourselves, or you have folks in your family or friends that do that. And these new delivery mechanisms, TV Everywhere and OTT, they're headed into the ring. It'll be a long, protracted battle, and uh, it'll get very interesting. I'll take your questions if you have any, and I appreciate you listening. Go ahead. So, two questions for you. One is, has there been any further research into why, when so many people have you know, DVR or VOD through their cable companies, through the MSOs, through satellite TV, whomever their cable TV providers are, are still sitting on the couch at 8 p.m. to watch linear television, even though they could theoretically watch that exact same show at any time that's convenient for them. I think... Uh, is, it like a, is, it, is it almost like a, um, I've always done it, so therefore like a nostalgic thing? Has there been any research into just why people are not just fully taking advantage of all the services they're paying for and freeing up their evening schedule? That's a good question. The question is, just for video here, uh, why folks aren't taking advantage and streaming more, or, or, or why are they uh, still in the habit of watching linear television? And I think there's plenty of research on that, but I think you hit the nail right on the head. It's a force of habit. We like to do certain things at certain times. Uh, there's a lot of folks that still consider the news appointment viewing. Now, the news is a challenge business in terms of ratings, but a lot of folks, and a lot of it's local, at 10 or 11 o'clock, I'm watching the news. At 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm watching the news. What's going on in my neck of the woods? That's always interesting to people. Plus, when you think about what are the dominant programs in television, broadcast and cable, it's sports, and sports is very time-centric. You know, it's program viewing. You want to be there. And uh, that slide I showed about the, uh, the top 10 programs just for last week, not only was it the game of the week on Sunday night, 
Sunday game night or Sunday NFL. It was the pregame that was also in the top 10. So folks are locked into that as well. And also people want to be in the conversation with programs they follow and love. So think of Mad Men or, uh, or Breaking Bad or some of these. People want to be up to date. And I think that probably has a lot to do with it. I think we're not there yet, but I think we're maybe going there. Sure, and I think that's that's a part of it, right? These, you know, uh, I'm not going to go out on a limb here, but I think you're all technologists to a certain degree. We're early adopters, or we're, we're regular users. A lot of folks are, um, but I don't think people. I think it's, as you say, a long march. People have not readily adapted that behavior, so it's second nature to them. Now, we're seeing it more. We see it a lot more with millennials who are just used to that type of behavior. You know, I'm in my 40s. I grew up watching TV at certain times. Now, asking me to do many things at once, you know, I can do it, but I'm just not used to that yet. But there's not, it's not a secret that Twitter is, you know, getting into the Twitter TV business either. A lot of folks know where this, where the puck is going, so to speak, and you know we may, we may not see it in the next two or three years, but look out five years, a decade, and and I think we'll be having a different conversation then. Right up front. Regarding the, um, the TV uh, everywhere model, um, do you see any providers not or uh, making it available for uh, people to just subscribe to that service rather than? Right. That's a that's tricky. Some folks asked me that question last night. What's tricky about that is the advertising model, right? Cable, uh, cable networks make their money through MSO subscription fees, right? To your, you know prime uh, networks like ESPN and and some of the news organizations make a lot of money from the cable providers. Uh, because they charge subscription fees against that. And then there's the other part of the way we make money, which is advertising dollars. So you don't want to bite either of the hands that feed you. Advertisers want to be where their, audience is, where their audience is. And as I showed, the audience is still predominantly on television. So it's going to take a different type of model or a different structuring of the model so that you can be an advertising delivery mechanism while programming off of cable or off of regular broadcast TV for that to work. Uh, I don't know if any of you folks saw the, uh, uh, the keynote from Adam Bessemer at Yahoo. They're creating original content on their own that is off of that model, but they're still stuck with pre-roll advertising, just like the rest of us. We need to solve that riddle of creating that before TV everywhere can get off of traditional cable or broadcast platforms. It's, gonna be, it's, it's, a, it's uh, one of the trickiest things probably facing the industry, but it'll be fascinating to see how it works out. In the back. It's a good question. I'm just going to go to that slide so I can, I think I have a little bit more clarity on that. Baby boomers are watching, I don't have it included here. Baby boomers are watching more television than, uh, than millennials and then, than the demographic. Um, they are used to it in a lot of ways. And if you look at the news, for example, or 60 Minutes is a good example of that. What, sit through a sit through the forty sit through sixty minutes of sixty minutes. Half the ads are pharmaceutical ads, right? So advertisers are right are where they want to be. Even in even in cable news, the the average demo is older um, than the target demo. The target demo is watching ESPN and other channels. So they are they they like. Their devices, baby boomers and, and 65 and older, they're into their devices as well, but they have not as much as millennials um, 
connected what, with what they watch and what they stream at the same time at this point. We may get there, but still, this is driven by millennials and, and slightly older in the target demo. Older folks are still predominantly just TV watchers. They are push people. Bring it to me. Bye. Uh, any innovation is going to cost money. You're from ESPN. CNN. CNN. Okay. Uh, but sports seems to be driving the money in spending. I mean, huge amounts of contracts. And it seems that television is bidding against each other in driving the cost of sports contracts. And we've been getting legislation from Congress of trying to break down into tiering uh, to allow sports packaging uh, from that. You see this breaking up, or is this just going to, is this just the market happening? Yeah, that, that's the market, and I don't see it breaking up. You look at the bidding rights for future Olympics, off the charts. The NFL, had a, you know, recently changed hands over the last couple of years. Astronomical sums of money. That's where the audience is, and, you know, it's a self-feeding mechanism in a lot of ways. Advertisers want to be there because that's where the audience is. That drives up rates. Um, that allows for bigger contracts on cable or, or the networks, which allows more revenue sharing, hypothetically, among the teams, which allow them to pay more to the players. You know, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So sports is, has been and will be where the money is for now. This may be a completely third rail question, but I'm asking anyway. That in recent days, there's been a lot of questioning as to whether the measurement techniques that are giving us the results of what these top 10 programs are, what they really mean anymore. 2,000 homes in Kansas from Nielsen households, no matter can tell us really a uh, really authentic way what digital viewers are watching. So, so even though they're they're shifting more to a new sort of models, uh, I still see people in advertising the entire industry being based on techniques and measurement that have been around for 60 years. So I'm just curious in your opinion on that. Yeah, I am one of those folks that questions the ratings all the time. It is the standard of measurement we use. The accuracy is tough to predict, and especially with television. So the television may be on in a Nielsen home, but maybe I went to the backyard to, uh, you know, flip the stakes, or maybe I, uh, you know, went into the other room, or maybe I just left the TV on. So it is tricky, and it's hard to say whether that's working. It is still the standard, but that's why you see Twitter uh, getting the Twitter TV ratings. Nielsen just got into the Twitter TV ratings because they want to try to measure engagement on a much broader or on a much more diverse scale. So I would say that we will see changes in the way um, advertisers and other folks look at ratings and try to slice it and dice it in different ways to really target whether their audience is where they think they are. And it's so much different from the web, obviously. You know, I don't know if folks here are familiar with the chart beats or the omnitures of the world. And, uh, but if you're not, if you look at chart beat against your web property, especially in news, it's super humbling. Now, you may have an enormous amount of visitors, like we do at CNN.com or CNNMoney.com, um, and we're blessed with that, and we, you know, we're, we program with that in mind, but when you look at what they're engaging in and for how long they're actually engaged, it's pretty humbling. And it's a challenge to those of us that are creating content to say, how can we make them stick around longer? Now, that's not a new challenge. That's been here forever on TV, on radio, but online, but online, those measurements don't lie. Numbers don't lie. And uh, when you look at the fact that, you know, maybe, you, you know, you're writing seven, eight paragraphs onto a story, on a news story, and your reader is reading, you know, a sixth of the way down and they're onto something else, it makes you wonder. Or you look at your online video consumption and, um, you know, how many people started it? How many people made it a quarter of the way through? How many people made it all the way through? How many people made it all the way through and then on to the next video? Uh, it's pretty humbling. So the, the challenge is on us to really engage them deeper, but because the measurement is so precise, uh, it paints a much different picture of what you're, who you're actually reaching. But it's a good question. Sir. Uh, CNN is such an international brand. What do you do to localize video, websites, different languages, et cetera? Well, we have um, content in different languages and websites that are you know, international or specific to regions. but. The targeting is so difficult that we're not necessarily going to program re-voice over a, a news, international news story in Romanian for our Romanian audience. No offense to the Romanian audience, but that's too hyper-specific. Um, you know, what we're trying to do, you know, we're not going to be hyper-local other than the fact that we have affiliates that belong to our news source service 
and we serve videos from them to our audience. Um, but you can personalize what you want to make sure that you can curate your own experience to a certain degree. But it's just too thin of a uh, uh, you know, thread and needle to actually pinpoint that audience where they are. Now, I know a lot of companies have tried that. A lot of media companies have tried hyperlocalization, like AOL and Patch. It is a very tricky and difficult um, road to navigate. But I think, you know, I, I was, I'll ask that question again last night. How do you, for, especially for folks that are cord cutters, how do you localize stuff? Well, it's very hard to do that. And, uh, and it's very costly. So I don't know if we'll get to that point. Maybe some folks are working, I'm not aware of, but it's, it's one of the trickier things to do. Any other questions? All right. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in.